It's a new set and a new Fast 9 composition that is taking over the meta to start off launch week. One player in North America has played the same composition to climb thousands of LP and be one of the first players to reach Masters alongside Dish Soap and many others. In this episode of Into Deep, we're going to hop on board with Brosef, an up-and-coming player from North America who has spammed a single Fast 9 composition to gain thousands of LP. I've also accompanied a couple slides to help guide us through this video, so make sure to pause if you need to. Before we begin, I want to explain in one quick minute what is the game plan for the new Fast 9 into Set 11 Inkborn Fables. If you need a pause to read it, go ahead. Step 1, vote for the high resource portals. If you get to level 9 and you hit, but you don't have any items for it, it still is actually not that powerful. So high resources, not just high gold, is really important. Loose subscription, crab rave, scuttle puddle, gold subscription, even prismatic augments can be really helpful. Step 2, preserve HP stages two and three, that HP is going to be traded later on, kind of similar to how we played Heartsteel in the previous set, because you're going to need to lose in stages four and five to get to nine. Step three, focus on making your gold interest break points early, because if you don't, it doesn't matter if you preserve a lot of HP, you're not going to have enough economy to get to nine and actually roll a decent amount of gold. Step four, probably the most important step I can give you is that a lot of people just don't roll at all at level six, seven, and eight, and you really should be doing it if you need to upgrade specific tiers of units. If you need to upgrade two costs, roll at six. If you need to upgrade three cost roll at seven and if you need to upgrade four cost roll at eight if you never roll you're probably going to bleed too much hp and then you get to level nine roll twice and die has anybody seen that before step five get to level nine with about 70 80 gold to roll and you can count the units that you can sell and have a predetermined build in your head use things like the team planner so in this example i have something called dj walrus which is diana janna for the dragon lord and have a suite of legendaries anchored by Huey and azir who are the two strongest units you can play around i do have more slides and tips but let's go ahead and start the gameplay and then i'll introduce it later on Brosif is a player who's been grinding tier 2 competitive TFT for quite some time. In North America, he actually almost got signed by Disguised, which is an esports organization that has some professional TFT players. But unfortunately, he got scammed. Uh, he ended up getting second place while having eight point lead over Milk because of checkmate format. So if we played a standard tournament, he very likely should have won and he would have been on Disguised. He's also a part of the Lab, which is an up and coming practice group in North America who made deep runs at regionals. You may have heard some of their other players like Rainplosion or even Vanilla, the guy who played the gear and reroll in one of my previous videos. Brosif is considered the second or third strongest player from that group. We're in a pretty strong lobby. We have Ramblin and Dish Soap. Even McGarkey, a professional player from France, is also competing in the boot camp alongside uh, the early launch of Set 11 Dickmore Fables. And Brosif starts off with a Rek'Sai 2 option to try to play around as his anchor frontline. When you're trying to play a fast nine core strategy, you almost need to take like whatever upgrades you can play around early in order to anchor your front line as best as you can. Let's go ahead and take a look at the augments. We got Stan United, Pandora's, and Aspiring Griptaf. Stan United is back, and everyone remembers how powerful Jazz can be in terms of having more active traits scale the power of your composition. But the problem is it's not very good early, and so I don't think we can take it right now. We don't preserve HP that way. Pandora's items is really interesting because it is giving you power in the form of an item, but the trade-off is that you don't know if it's something that you can play Let's say you get Pandora's items, the full item isn't playable, or even if the item is playable, it's not necessarily good for the units that you upgraded. If you get Pandora's items and you get, you know, like a strong AD item, but you have Rek'Sai and, you know, these Wardens, you actually need a defensive item. But Pandora's items is pretty awkward right now and not guaranteed. Inspiring Epitaph is also a late game scaling option because the more HP you have, the better that max HP shield is. And the more units you have, the more you get value off of each individual activation of it. And so I actually don't like any of these options. So we reroll all these options and we have Too Much Candy, Wandering Trainer, and Mythic Crest. Uh, too Much Candy is really powerful for early game reroll. A lot of times you're trying to capitalize on the fact that Too Much Candy gives you really good odds at level three to roll for one cost. So a lot of people play too much candy into like Kogma and Caitlyn reroll, or they try to go for Yasuo and Ari. Just having multiple one cause you can roll for gives you a lot of value. And then you also have the benefit of rolling a lot also at stage three at level four for a bunch of those one costs. However, too much candy is also really good to even roll for early game tempo because another way you can think about it is too much candy lets you roll for a stable amount of one cost two stars. So you can play like Garen two, Sivir two, Jax two, and maybe even hit that Zyra or Riven and then have a strong story weaver core. And then that also applies to Yasuo two, Ari two, play around Faded, so on and so forth. And then you can just try to level and then at the beginning of each stage you just get six free rerolls which is kind of a lot you're getting 12 gold worth of rerolls and then even if you roll six more times after that that means you get 50 percent discounted rolls so you can roll 12 times for the cost of six gold that's a lot uh, to be able to pick up like if you play too much candy and then you don't actually have the actual gold to buy it you end up 
like rolling and then using all your gold to hold units and then you're stuck at zero gold not making any interest and you're just poor for the entire game can't level so you do have to kind of manage that risk and reward wandering trainer is also really really good but it does kind of push you into sort of playing a specific direction and end up encouraging a lot of times to either re-roll or push for like a deep vertical and that's really hard to justify doing for a fast nine or two strategy wandering trainer is very powerful don't get me wrong if you do get a strong core of support synergies like Sage and Dragon Lord. It can be very, very good for late game flex options. But if you do end up getting something that kind of commands you to play a certain way, such as getting things like Umbral, and then you kind of have to play within this like, you know, Yone and a Loon's type of spot, then maybe you just end up being in a situation where you can't really arguably fast nine. Mythic Crest, for the very same reason, can actually be really good. Mythic is one of the traits that lets you fast nine because you can play around a really strong core of Lilia and Nautilus and then kind of have that Mythic tag into things like Huey later into the game. But I think ultimately the choice here is too much candy because it does give you what you really want, which is resources. In this case, it's free golds to reroll. It can help upgrade his board and it also preserves that early game HP. So we do end up going with too much candy and now we're going to roll six times. And I think we're just going to try to see if we can upgrade things. Okay, we hit Jax 2, and that gives us the ability to level and try to play around the Wardens. And this is actually a really good thing that Brosev just did, which was he didn't just roll six times and then realize he had to sell some of those units to level. He wants to play for tempo. He's using what's traditionally a reroll augment to try to push levels, so he has to actually weigh both. And remember, those six rerolls stay throughout the course of the stage, so he doesn't actually have to use them all right now. So that kind of decision making to split up the free resources is actually really smart to make sure that he can at least get off on the right foot. And right away, I think something that a lot of other players wouldn't be doing. So then the follow up would be, why not just roll right now? Okay, we didn't use all our rerolls because we couldn't afford it and we need to level. Why not just roll this turn? The reality is he lost the first round, so it's not like he is incentivized to try and start his win streak immediately right here. And he doesn't even have that many pairs to roll for. The only thing he could roll for would be Sivir 2. So I do actually agree with focusing on making economy because he's going to need that economy in order to uh, try and push levels and then use too much candy later on in the game. By the way, we didn't talk about the fact that he slammed Bloodthirster. That is the best available item that he can play. The other options were Giant Slayer. We also have the option of slamming Runin's Hurricane with the bow and the cloak, but we don't have an upgraded unit, and so the extra bolt does less damage. Not to mention that we don't want to be playing AD. We're focusing on AP, and Runin's kind of encourages to lean into that AD line. And then Giant Slayer is weak early, but strong late. So Bloodthirster is just something that we can do to preserve a little bit of HP. And yeah, we lost three, which is not great, but we're still trying to fight to preserve that HP and kill a couple units per fight. Here's our first encounter. Orn adds an artifact to each champion, and we're looking at diamond hands to generate gold, which is really good. A lot of times in these artifact situations, think about if you can reasonably take gold generation, and every other gold generator source is conditional, right? If Goldmancer and Gold Collector proc, that's great. They can farm multiple gold, but diamond hands one uh guarantees that gold and two it's actually really good to stack that front line and late game diamond hands is really really good to handle that burst so it's good now and it's good later okay so we took talisman of speed for more damage and we also opened our team planner here to showcase the kind of core units that we want to play around i'm going to go ahead and bring in my second slide here to talk about our game plan going to fast nine in terms of playing fast nine there's three core units that everyone wants to play around because of what they provide it's Huey, azir and orn Quay is the AoE carry that nukes and hits the back line. And also he's a bunch of utility because he heals your team. In fact, Quay is just straight up overpowered and a lot of people expect him to get nerfed. So basically get the free LP while you can just to play him on every board. And that's not even kind of the fact that Huey over the course of turns gives you a free duplicator on whatever champion you want. So he kind of scales your board. He's just insane. Azir is your burst carry because Huey, while he does do a bunch of AoE, can't take down those super tanks or those really defensive warriors that are three star, right? Like a NAR three. You're going to have trouble bursting it down. And so Azir is your single target AP nuker. And then Orange is your frontline anchor and also kind of a support. He can simultaneously take a lot of damage while also providing extra items to the rest of your composition. And if you have other ways to synergize with Orn, like cybernetic bulk or something like that, it can be really, really powerful. So top priority means you're seeing them in your shop, you buy them, you hold them, or you probably play it if you possibly could fit them. Priority two is usually how you stabilize. This is the vehicle of how you get to fast nine and some of the core units you're going to play around until you find the five cost. Because you can't just roll down and say, well, I didn't hit any five costs. I'm not going to play any units. You do need a secondary set of units so you can have a foundation to build off of. And the foundation is around Lilia, Annie, and Nautilus. 
these two give you Invoker alongside Azir. Nautilus gives you the Mythic alongside Lilia and Hui. And it's a good mix because Nautilus and Annie are two frontline units that can help you stabilize. And then Lilia's a backline unit, giving us an even 3-3 three, three split. And then the rest of the spots, you can basically splash in whatever makes a lot of sense. So Dragon Lords are really good for the extra attack speed and damage. You can tech in a fourth Invoker as well, so you can get a little bit more AP for Lilia and Azir. Even Annie could be really good. You can tech an Altruist for the generic amount of defensive stats. Sage for extra Omni Vamp and AP as well, if you're lacking a little bit of AP burst. And so just kind of like splash in a bunch of these random traits in that make a lot of sense and can also make the late game board. Priority three is our win condition of just getting a bunch of five costs on the board and potentially upgrading them to scale up. Wukong and Rakan are two of the best five costs to just play just due to their traits. Altruist, Heavenly, and Sage are just really, really good support ones. And then you can fill out the rest with like Udyr, Lissandra, and Set. I will say one thing that this is just one of many different variations you can play. For example, I gave you the DJ Walrus, which is W-H-A-R-L-U-S. But like, but you can also do a bunch of other variations at Fast 9. And that's kind of what makes it really exciting to play and also really hard because sometimes you're just not going to hit like these core units. You're going to have to play a different set. But in general, it's good to have a game plan going in. And then when it's not coming together, you start to deviate a little bit. And so going back to Brosive's board, looks like he is playing for kind of this walrus, DJ walrus setup to try and make sure that he has something that he knows he can play for. And if he's not hitting, he'll pivot off of that. But going back to what we saw earlier, he didn't buy and hold Janna just because she's part of the late game core doesn't mean she can contribute right now. He rolls and finds another Janna, by the way, and actually sells the Diana to get there. Okay, we're going to use our free rerolls here and see if we can hit anything else. I do like holding Diana over Janna because as you level up, it becomes harder and harder to find Janna compared to Diana because she's tier two versus tier three. But he ends up selling it anyways. And that's kind of what we're talking about. Like preserve your HP, but focus on making economy. And if he can win two in a row here, this would be really huge to help give him a little bit of that upswing and not try to go for that five loss. I think a lot of players in these spots would be just like, okay, well, I lost three. I'm just going to lose five. But I think it's really valuable to know that if you can preserve that HP and start turning things around, let's go for it. It doesn't work out and that's okay. So this is actually kind of a awkward slash... Uh, low roll opening we took something like too much candy to try and get early momentum and that's just not happening right now it could also have to do with the fact that we stand things like bloodthirster which is not inherently a strong hp preservation item on jacks and so maybe in hindsight it was better to not slam and then wait for the first carousel but at the same time i like where the mentality is of trying to fight aggressively to even preserve two life per round which could be huge but at the beginning of stage three we get dropped a warmogs or a nashers equivalent we are angling for Story Weaver to help us anchor our mid game. And Story Weaver right now is very powerful because you can have Kale be your carry. And that Zyra is actually really big because every star level you get upgrades the strength of Kale. We're not using our free rerolls right now either because we want to level to six. And I do think that we're going to eventually struggle to make economy breakpoints. If we roll six times, we're going to go from 41 down to probably the 20s if we're going to hold all these units. And so uh, I do like the hesitation here and also the benefit of he got stronger, right? He already hit Zyra too. He doesn't necessarily need to roll in this spot. Let's take a look at these augments here. Radiant Relics, Warden Crown, and Buried Treasures. Warden Crown's okay. You can level up, play Gnar, and get a fourth Warden. And uh, have that redemption even be really nice with that Wardens. But I think that it's okay, not great. Buried Treasures 3 is too slow. I think that it's really good at 2-1 because... Stage two is somewhat inconsequential with like how long it takes you to get your items and you can kind of greet it. But the reality is stage three is the stage that he wants to win. Because if he loses stage three and he has to wait six rounds to get his full prismatic value, yeah, you have a bunch of your items, but uh, he's going to lose a lot more HP than he wants to unless he has a really, really strong board. I don't want to take Barry Treasure if he's already very strong. Radiant Relics is always a safe pick. You can always take a generic Radiant item and I think it's always fine to play if you want to. So he holds on to Radiant Relics because he knows that's a safe option. Rolls Jewel Lotus versus Accomplice. Uh, Jewel Lotus is really high top end, but Accomplice is actually kind of incredible. Uh, the support these gloves is just really, really strong and you get eight gold. So you have a double whammy. You're trying to get a little bit more econ and you also get some support items which can be really powerful things like ages and locket and, and z's can be very very strong so we end up choosing accomplice and we get that extra gold and now we're going to level and roll a little bit which kind of goes back to what we we're talking about before which is being willing to roll at level six seven and eight he recognizes that if he can roll and hit things like this five story weaver be really really good also uh, i really like a very small thing he did which is he put thieves gloves onto a unit on the bench to see what the items would be first 
and that might determine who he puts it on onto the field for positioning purposes. In this set, your Thieves Skills are locked per each round. So you know that if you put this item onto you on the bench, it's going to be guaranteed a Chalice of Power and a needlessly big gem. That's not going to change if you upgrade the unit or sold the unit in previous sets that used to influence what your Thieves Gloves was. So you could be able to juggle your Thieves Gloves and try to get like Zephyr and Shroud back in the day. These days, it's the same. And so you put that Thieves Gloves onto a unit on the bench, see who it's good for, and then, you know, try to get that one extra round advantage. Rostev ended up selling his Jax and putting Annie in. We talked about how Annie could be a really core cool unit. And he actually gets to do two birds and one stone. One, it's probably stronger. Yeah, you lose the Warden, but Annie is really good early. And he doesn't have anti-heal. One of the things that's kind of nice about Annie's uh, secondary effect is that not only does she become harder to kill, but she also burns and wounds enemy units. So you have like that effect of Morello and Sunfire. And also another thing too that I noticed is that he guaranteed gets to make gold and hold extra units because he gets to sell Jax while not having Annie on the bench. So he gets three gold back. He gets stronger, wins. It's just a thing that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we pick a tier off carousel. We're going to level to seven and use the other portion of our free rolls. And then I really like how he's kind of distributing his rolls because he, again, has recognized that, yes, he could use all six free rolls very quickly, but uh, he's just going to prioritize instead trying to go for uh, like rolls at six and seven and possibly eight to try to make sure that he's consistently getting a streamlined curve of power. He didn't necessarily position best for Shroud, but that's okay. He also prioritized making a Shiv because he doesn't have Shred. He instead chose for power on the Kale by going for two red options. He chose the Talisman of Haste and then the Scroll of Speed or whatever it's called. Oh my god, he hits a Huey on seven. So this is very high roll. How do you actually tech in the Huey? I guess you could probably improve by putting Huey in over the Zoe. And then giving Shiv to Huey or Soraka. He actually chooses not to play Huey, which is actually really interesting and quite possibly incorrect. I think when you find Huey, it's also not just valuable to play him for the combat power, but now he will start supercharging his spots in the middle for duplicating. One thing really valuable at Huey is just because you put a unit in that center bench square so you can get like that duplicator doesn't mean that you have to commit to it. But what that means is you could put Morgana like right here in this center square and then after two rounds, take Morgana off, then put a five cost on it. And then three rounds later, you get that five cost. It's not going to be like, well, you have to invest into Morgana and then you have to start over when you put a new unit in. So because of that, he's like one round down, so to speak. But then the trade-off is he's stronger and therefore gets uh, an option to potentially keep his streak together, which is what he's fighting for. He's also, once again, not rolling at the beginning of the stage and still not playing Huey. So it looks like he wants to go for a fast eighth and then play for Huey reforges and get a shojin which is really big and i think this might be one of those if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of moments right now he's streaking and his board is good enough right now and he hasn't lost he hasn't had a reason to switch into Huey, but now he has lost so it's probably a level eight to start breaking apart the board and five through reaver was good enough on stage three but not good enough on stage four because a lot of people are rolling down and trying to get stronger let's take a look at his augments once more heavy hitter support cash and cybernetic bulk Ooh, cybernetic bulk is uh pretty high value in general because if you play around orn you could get a little bit more value than usual support cash is also really good as well if you can get you know really strong support item critical mass by having things like you know multiple ages because you combine it with the accomplice heavy hitters is much better for reroll so i think that's a no i'm willing to hold on to cybernetic bulk and reroll the first two options or even hold on to support cash and roll options one and three okay so we choose to hold on to cybernetic bulk and rule options one and two reinforcement is i think a little bit too much of the same thing of what we're going for which is we already have too much candy so we get a lot of extra rolls which is the equivalent of more gold i don't think we need more gold i think we want actual straight up combat power and combat power is in the form of combat cast or cybernetic bulk i do think that combat cast is really valuable in a lot of invoker based comps that he's trying to anchor into but so overall i just think bulk is probably better because our front line is very weak right now we only have any one and a gear and two and combat caster is just not nearly as high value as we normally want it to be cybernetic bulk it is so we're gonna level and sell and i think we can roll here some okay we hit galio so galio is already a big improvement we can stay on five story weaver or start taking in support traits we talked about the dragon lords we talked about some of the the altruists Having Riven 2 and Soraka 2 gives you a ton of AoE. Having Riven and Soraka is really good. He positions to get a little bit of Radnuman's value. Always keep note of what is the uh, support item that you can get. Although, again, he's not really getting a lot of value off of the 
uh, Shroud. He could improve that a little bit better. He puts the AP items onto Huey and makes sure that he's also starting to duplicate the Elune in the center. And look at that. Able to actually get a very big win. Anytime you bench a unit, Malphite knocks your items off. Okay, so he, now he has really good removers, which is fantastic for multiple reasons. One, uh, he can get things like Shiv off of Huey in the later stage of the game. And also, he can now have this support item move to a spot that actually makes a lot of sense. So if it's like a backline Chalice of Power Zeke, he can knock that support item off and then put it onto a backline unit. And now for like moments like this, he can put the Randuins and the Zizu Rot now close to the front and put it on Riven instead. And the third reason that's also really good is now he can also put these components onto uh, different units and then he can knock it off later so he can get cybernetic bulk value. And so, you know, having Diamond Hands on Diana, that's non-committal. He can actually have that Diamond Hands on her, her for right now and then you know, bump it off later. And then meanwhile, spread the components to get cybernetic bulk value. Ends up being a very, very fortunate situation. He swaps in the Orn to over the Janna, just recognizes that he wants to try to duplicate Orn if he can. We're lacking some actual punch. I think we want uh, AD items. Okay, we get a Udir off of Carousel with a bow, and that is also fine. We could end up just spreading for more cybernetic value, or we could end up going for uh, a Nashers, which is fine. Shojin Nashers is a pretty classic combination. Shojin helps you cast, and after you cast, you get additional attack speed, and Nashers also gives you some uh, bonus stats for AP. He does end up having AD just miss the way which is probably not that big of a deal but does end up hurting a little bit ah uh, okay it's because he's playing the red kale and so red kale gives adjacent allies attack speed so already has attack speed on way so it's not nearly as impactful and now just look at how much uh critical mass he has he just has so many active traits in a lot of power through sage a lot of tankiness through altruist he even has exalted in that's one really heads up thing that uh, Brosov is included, so he gets a little bonus damage here. And so by having extra Exalted in and printing one EXP per round, he's able to get to level 9. And now you can see him bumping the Thief's Gloves off and now getting Chalice in the back, repositioning accordingly, putting Diamond Hands onto Riven instead. This is just really good item management right now. And uh, just being able to play into what makes the comp really strong, which is stabilizing off of things like an early Huey, trying to play around what makes his board really efficient through like cybernetic and spreading. And it's not like he's doing anything crazy fancy positioning. Ah, he actually did something kind of nifty here. He had Orn onto the center square and now he moved the Udyr onto it, kind of recognizing that he'd rather use the, the Huey value to print the five cost instead. By the way, he can actually do one additional step, which is he could actually take this Udyr off now. So what he could do, for example, is uh, keep this Udyr off and wait till he finds a second Huey. Then when he finds a second Huey, puts that Huey back in and then it'll save. It's like banking four in and then uh, printing that Huey too. So you do have actually a lot of different things you can do with this Huey duplicator that is uh, pretty good and high skill expression. And so have fun playing around all those different kinds of uh, ways you can manipulate Huey. I like this positioning and we end up slamming a Shoujin onto Azir. Uh, looks like it's a pretty weak ghost fight going against, you know, in a, an Aphelios 2 with kind of awkward items. So during this fight, let me go ahead and talk about actually what are some of the core items we're going to be looking at for the rest of our composition. Way well, pretty much just wants two things. He wants mana and AP, although he ends up being the best Morello applier in the game because his giant Las Vegas sphere hits everything. And so it's a really good application of Morello. But if you don't, just put in other items that make sense, like a Gunblade, Jewel Gauntlet, Archangels, Giants, like whatever you can. Just get him damage uh, and mana. Azir ends up a lot of times holding things like Shiv, and Shiv is a lot better than Spark in this composition because Spark ends up reducing the magic resistance of the units in front, and Shiv can hit back line. And so a lot of times, you kind of just need someone to hold the Shiv in the back, and it does give a little bit of base stats. Just give it to Azir in a lot of cases, and then give him any leftover mana and AP because you want him to cast. One common use of Rage Blade is to put it on Azir because then he ends up kind of ramping up and casting a lot as the fight goes on. And that ends up being... Um, something that you do quite often because people are often slamming rage blade in stage two and stage three so they can get early game tempo but late game this item is not particularly very good and so you can just use it as like a mana generation source because every auto attack you get mana and defensively you want to give all the items to orn if i could choose what bis is on orn i think stone plate is just one of the best defensive items in the game right now on a lot of different units and it's really good early so it kind of curves out very well. And then Redemption ends up being really good as well for the damage reduction and the healing on, uh, you know, some of these units with a bunch of resistances like Behemoths. And then Declaw is just, you know, for the other AP matchups. It's an AP meta right now. And so Declaw ends up being quite good on Orn. But, you know, you can also just put like a bunch of other, uh, you know, defensive items as you get them. Even Val ends up being quite good because Orn casts fast and gives another item quickly. 
and then get some uh, stats as well. I also want to give a shout out to Thieves Gloves in general. I think uh, a lot of Thieves Gloves augments like Band of Thieves, Sleight of Hand, or even just Lucky Gloves uh, is pretty good for this composition because you just have other five costs that just have a bunch of different stats you can use. You can throw Thieves Gloves onto like Rakan or Wukong or Udyr and then just watch them pop off. Oh, we went back to Bros's board and it looks like he actually lost the ghost fight. My bad. Uh, all right, well, that, that's okay. I mean, it wasn't that consequential of a fight and we're trying to get to nine anyways next turn and roll a bunch of gold. We also got the encounter that just makes you really fast and speedy with Sivir, so it doesn't really matter. So we got to nine and now we printed an extra copy of Udyr and now we're going to use our free rerolls and all of our one cost rerolls. So we banked all of our rerolls for this very turn. A bunch of rolls and we hid Orn 2 and Udyr 2. And this is the advantage of using Team Planner because he rolled and he kind of knew exactly what he wanted to play. Didn't have to like say like, oh, do I want like, you know, these three costs in case I don't hit or what about some of these utility units? He knows exactly the vision of the Team Planner of what he wants to play and was able to execute it. And by hitting Lissandra 2 and Udyr 2, those are two units that are kind of secondary compared to what we talked about, right? A lot of times you're looking at Hui 2, Azir 2, and then trying to play around like Rakan and Wukong as we talked about the main support units. But he ends up hitting things like Lissandra 2 and he's not even really playing around her trace, right? There's no Porcelain unit in and there's no uh, Arcanist in. So he's just trying to play around whatever he can hit. He ends up seeing that he has Shroud. So he's going to put this these gloves onto a unit that he wants to shroud. He wanted to shroud the Galio, it looks like, alongside uh, the Alawi, but he ended up missing. Oh, that's a little bit awkward. I like the positioning of the Orn next to the uh, Lissandra so he can get like an extra AP item on her. He got Death Cap, but it looks like... Oh my God, this is a Shroud diff for sure. If we Shroud it, we definitely would have won. Okay, so a couple of rounds. That's a little bit awkward. Not the cleanest, but still, because we preserve a lot of HP, we end up being in a spot where we can afford to take a couple losses. We can get a Hui pair here, which is really good. And we still do have a little bit of gold to roll, which is nice. And we teched in Exalted, which is really, really important to get that bonus damage. So we're going to roll so we can hit Hui too. We have Aegis and Randuins. So looking at what we can do to position strategically, I would love to also get uh, Azir and possibly Huey. Okay, he chooses not to greet it. And this is actually really, really important. A lot of times when people have things like Aegis, they're like hard greeting and trying to get like Azir next to Huey, but that makes them very vulnerable to AoE. So you have to be very careful about doing that too often. Some matchups you probably can get away with it and others you can't. It looks like we're having trouble dealing with Amumu. And Amumu 3 is one of those tanks we talked about of why it's important to have like good single target burst because yes we could have a lot of damage through the way but if we don't have single target we just can't get past the tanks taking out a loon i think takes out our exalted so at this point i think we recognize that exalted isn't doing enough and that is sort of what makes exalted very cool in my opinion is that sometimes you have to know when to just give up on exalted even if it's really good late game goes for a locket i like the diane in the back line now he's giving zeke's to both way and azir and his opponent does have Udyr 2 with a Dryad Emblem, but I don't think that that Udyr can get past our front line. Oh, the set's uh, on our back line. That is not that big of a deal, actually. It looks like uh, we're going to win through just mass numbers and gang up on uh, this other level 9 player. And so it was a little bit rocky, but we survived stage 5, transition to 9, and we get 6 free rerolls now. So now we get another big spike of power. And we're also top four guaranteed alongside Dish of Vo and Hypnoticus. And so I think this was the hardest stage to clear because we should be able to hit. We get way too guaranteed off of the duplicator. And we also have Pot of Gold. I completely forgot about the portal. Uh, so we have a ton of gold to actually use. And he levels to 10. And now he's going to bank his Hui rolls. Oh, this is a little bit awkward. He actually is a little bit poor. He's actually too poor to oh. even use his free rerolls. Oh, God. Okay, we got the Shroud. Oh, no. Oh, no. We missed the Shroud and we missed the, the Chalice. But we do have Hui too. And we did upgrade a bunch of different things. So we're getting a little bit of a sloppy moment. But I think most of the macro has solved this. They're still stuck on level 8. Playing like, you know, the Umbral board very very strong and now we can uh buy another unit and get a copy of rakan okay this is interesting did he buy this for the gold so now he has two rakans i don't know if i actually agree with that i think i would like him to save it because now for example he could guarantee that a zero two next turn so i think he he did it because he thought that he wanted to get five gold to roll but in these late game situations uh you really really want to make sure that you're optimizing for each turn and yes he did get five gold but we didn't end up using it looking at this fight seems like we are too stable for the other player now looks like if this player loses here now then i think we're gonna win out okay now we hit his ear two and wukong two uh oh can we sell this tristana oh tristana is probably for exalted isn't it it is 
um okay so we're holding on to Tristana for the exalted and that's actually another really important thing when you're playing level 10 chances are you should be able to fit an exalted because the three units that you can tag in might be worth it and you have so many team slots and it looks like this is gonna be fight, last fight of the game no matter what I don't think that the opponent's gonna beat us because we beat them very handily the past couple times and we just keep getting stronger and that should do it GG's Brosif is going to dominate and makes a really good 5 HP stabilization all right well played so there you have it the fast nine composition that Brosif has spammed in order to climb thousands of lp and be one of the first players in north america to hit masters there are many other ways to play fast nine but this is one of the most effective ones that's been done in launch week so i wanted to highlight it as fast as i could for you guys the next time we cover fast nine i'll probably do an ad version focused around irelia and physical damage and i'll show you how that's done but that's going to be for another day until then i'll see you guys next time